start. So uh, this this talk is all about football and how we can go dig deeper, like beyond the score line, go inside into how football works. And but before we start, let me introduce myself real quick. So my name is Paset, and you can also call me my. I'm a data scientist. Currently work in Japan, and I normally like I my work consists of develop the recommender system and also the content moderation with AI and and all the machine learning stuff. And that is uh, I, I think the and anyway today we are not talking about my work. So what we are going to talk about today is about football and outside my work I also running a football blog. In, uh, it's called Weekend Analyst. Most of the time, I cover my beloved team, Newcastle United, which they're playing well recently. So yes, and the content is in Thai. Uh, I have a Facebook page here. You can, I will be really appreciate if you follow my content. But uh, yes, thank you. And uh, beside Newcastle, I also cover the the interesting topic in the football and also some technology cutting edge technology that are happening in, in the football. So yes, yeah, so it it could be uh it, it could be friendly for every every fan and every team or a, anyone who interested in football. This is my page. And before we start, uh this kind of like really quick adversarial. So like uh uh Data Wow is the leader in data and AI in Thailand. So they are enabler for, for the for the AI uses and use of data to solve the problem for, for Thai, Thai company and also foreign company as well. And uh, I have today, like I, I have I, I am myself today, I need to thank to the Data Wow to give me opportunity to start my work as a developer. So Data Wow is also a special place. In, in in my heart, and they are also hiring. We always hiring. So, if you are interested to work with very nice people, you know, and very nice culture, so you can ping me or like take uh, apply to all this position. Okay, so that's uh, all for the advertorial. So let's get start with the football. Uh, before we start, I, I would like to, to like to give some context for the football analytics and to do that we go back a bit in time for like fifteen years or so, like go back into two thousand eight and see the difference from what what fifteen years make different between two thousand eight and, and today. So oh, what happened to my presentation? Sorry. Okay, it backs. Okay, so I believe most of you have heard about the money ball. It's a story about the Oakland A, a baseball team who used the data to, to defy our odds in, in Major League Baseball. And it happened in 2002, if I remember correctly. And this is the first evidence on the internet that someone proposed using Moneyball with football. It happened in 2008 or 2009, sorry. And what, uh, what I tried to say from this is like, it took football six years to accommodate the idea of Moneyball, like using data in, into the football. Six years after the solid work case in baseball, that, that just only a guy who, who raised this up on random box on the internet, and that 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 kind of uh, representative for the state of football data at that point. So like it, so and yeah, but from from this, it could I, I think we can consider this as a starting point for football and I think as a whole. But it also take another four years to have this chart. So this uh, in 2012, uh, this guy here, Chris Anderson, he also wrote a book about football and data. He came up with a blog post, a uh, blog post to 
show the relationship between the conversion rate and shot for team in Premier League in season 2009. So this is the most advanced thing we have in 2012 for football, I think, at least in public domain. So uh, like in the previous slide, it already takes six years to accumulate the idea, and it takes another three years to have this simple scatter plot on onto the internet about football. So because it it the football analytic at that time was so I think like so behind compared to other sports, especially for American games. But yes, that is for the history. But let's take a look right now in 2023. Let's see what we have in the in in the football domain about the data. So we have pretty rich uh, landscape for the for the football data. We have like a lot of great data provider over there, especially StatBomb and StatPerform. Previously, they named Opta. So they provide really, really high quality data set from, from the football matches. And we also have the hardware. If I, I'm not sure if you ever seen the, when players celebrate goals, they kind of like have sport bra. That, that is the catapult. It's a device to track the position of that player in a pitch and they can analyze the data, like how much this guy run, how this guy move, kind of stuff. And we also have consulting service and also open source too, both in Python and R. So, uh, and I think we, we, because of this really, really huge uh, infrastructure that we have, we also have like a lot of really active communities, especially in Twitter. I decline to call it X. It's like this. Let's sorry. So, and we also have really a lot of individual blogs on Substack, and also the that we also even have the really interesting competition on on Kaggle, for example, like the the competition that asks you to train the model to understand the whole game of football. Like they have a position of player and uh, the, for, for the whole games. And, and, and you, your task is to train whatever you need to, to make computer play football like human, do, human does. And we also have the small sport analytic conference here from MIT. Like they held the sport analytics to, to talk like bring the brightest mind in the world in football and in, in, in any sport to come together and share what they found in the, in the pre recent years. So with this diverse and rich community, so we have a lot of progress. We have made a lot of progress in, in terms of data in football community. Oh, oh skills are working. Okay, so it's come to this. I believe all of you have heard about the expected goal somewhere, maybe on Football Manager, on FIFA, or, or somewhere else. So this uh, kind of like a uh, poster boy for football analytics, before, because before, we, before the expected goal model, we have no way to measure the performance of any players in, in, in the game. Like all we have is like, we have kind of subjective evaluation on the players. Okay, this guy moved this way. This guy always shot from this side, and but all those were subjective. So, and here's come the expected goal is basically the model that say which shot or which which chance, uh, how how good the chance is. Like let's say like let's say I am a. a random footballer on the pitch and try to score because score eventually is the most important stat in football, right? So we can measure how well that player score a goal with the expected goal. Basically, it's a probability that the player can score from zero to one. And with this, it comes it in the, the expected goal is the in inspiration for 
more advanced usage of the stat and more advanced model in football. And we also have really bright people into the football industry. Uh, this guy here, Ian Graham, he, he got PhD from Harvard and he did uh, particle physics at CERN and he ended up at football. Maybe he found particle physics is too boring. So right now he is the head of research at Liverpool. His main contribution for, for, for the football is a model called pitch model, uh, pitch control, sorry. Uh, that pitch control model is the way to evaluate if this player, how, how much this player play a low in, in a result of the game. For example, like he's in, in Liverpool, right? And pitch control can say that like, if you put Mohamed Salah in the game, there is a like 10% chance that Liverpool could win the game, something like that. That that is his main contribution to to the football. And we have more of these bright people in football industry. I, I I would say like most of top teams in European leagues already have people from astrophysics, from math expert, and also like techno guru in, in, in their team for the data department already. And we also have the actual research paper. Like what I want to highlight, this paper from DeepMind and Liverpool, they try, uh, uh, it's called Tactic AI. Basically, this is a playbook for any set play or corner that coach can use to reference. Like for example, like uh, imagine there are uh, corner, kick, corner kick going on and people like, huddle in, in the front of the goal, right? And Tactic AI can advise a coach that, okay, this guy should move here to maximize the chance of scoring kind of stuff. Uh, my point for this is like, we really have like kind of like, I would say ecosystem for the football and the data analytics to thrive inside the industry. And we also have something like this, like uh, it's called Football Knot, uh, basically a machine that shoot a ball to a player. Like you can practice this, uh, any player to play in any situation. Like if you see the, the white wall here, it bring out the football and coach can see the data from inside the, inside the simulator and improve player and, and with this machine and the data they have, uh, they, they, they can have like, uh, add more competitive edges to their teams and their players. And I believe this machine is really common in Bundesliga, like most of team in Bundesliga already have this in, in their facility. And I think you would know this guy, Kevin De Bruyne here. Uh, he also used data to, to up his wage in his current contract. Like in 2020 or 21, I'm not sure, he asked the consulting firm called FC Analytics to, to, per, to help him maximize his new uh, wage in his new contract. And he ended up like push his wage from like under million, under 100 million pound a year into like over a million kind of like, I'm, I'm not sure exactly the numbers, but he used the data to, to uh, get more salary from, from his new contract. And that is for the industrial use, but the next question is how can we like, the common, like the, the fan, how uh, the, we, I, I believe all of us are football fans. And how can we use those data that already used in the industry to, to understand the football more or like maybe like uh, to enjoy the team. Sometimes your, your team might not play well and you might need to find something to enjoy rather than the, the result in the pitch. So, but before we go that, like, uh, is there any question about we, uh, the interaction? But no, I, uh, if no, I will go on. Like, since there are already rich data inside the football in the industry, I, I, I call there are something called spillover from the industry to the public domain. And most uh, and all the, the, the data that spill over from 
into the public domain uh, are being used by all of the fans over the world. And any data that you see, I, 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 I would say with some confidence that it comes from these three websites, FBREP, Footmob, or it does who scores. The, the, the data that you see on the internet from like from from the hobbyists or, or any public domain would definitely come from one of these three data uh, data providers. And I will show some example for the FB rep. Is I think this is one of the really best website in the world, and they also cover other spots as well. But it's kind of like really boring website, like white screen, more like Excel than than the actual website. But you can see a lot of data cover like from the basic stats, like the score line, the number of shots, or, or whatever, into the really advanced stat, for example, the expected goal I, we already discussed earlier. And also the like something similar to expected threat, but it would call expected exit. So basically like to say the probability that this path going to be the exit for for like for the certain events. Uh, and I really encourage everyone here to, to visit the website, the FBREF. It covers more than, I was, uh, if I remember correctly, like it covers more than 20 leagues all over the world for the advanced stats like XG and more, more than 50 leagues for the basic stats. And with this data, I think there are a lot of things that we can pick from the data set that we have. Like, for example, we can start from the business side. Uh, because uh, at the end of the day, football is one of the enter entertainment business, right? So it's all about money. This chart here is the relationship between wage and point per game for the team in top five European leagues and MSL in the past 11 years. The one that I highlight in green is a champion, and the one in red, uh, those in red, are teams that relegated in, in, in the past 11 years. What you can see here is all the winners pay more wage, like tend to pay, oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry for interruption. All the all the champions they tend to pay more wage than the the, the team that were relegated in in each season. And okay, uh, this chart might be skewed by this guy here. Probably the the PSG they have too much money to spend. But what what I want to say is like okay, at the end of the day, wage of the team is the best determiner for, for the performance in the pitch. And if you are the really die-hard fan for the Premier League, there is a cut-off here that like kind of like rule of thumb for the Premier League that you need to score more than, uh, you need to get more than 40 points to survive in the league each year. And let's say like the, the season is 38 match long, and if you go with like 1.0 point per match, it takes 38 points, so that, that kind of align with the rule of thumb that we have. And to get it, uh, to make it more fancy, I try to fit this, but it's not a good practice to fit any line into the data, but I do it anyway. So uh, this is the relationship between the wage and point. So every one million pound that you spend into the wage bill, it, con it probably contribute to 20 points in your, at, at the end of the season for each team. Uh, the gap for the 20 points is something like, for the last season, is the gap between the champion and the fifth place in Premier League, or the 10th place and the 18th place. That is the gap that 20 points make. Uh, okay, but is that a real? Like, is that true? Is that the way she influenced the performance in the match? To answer that question, we also have data set from MLS, the Major League Soccer in, in the US. They have a thing called salary cap. 
So that means any team in MLS, they cannot spend more than the salary cap. And what we see from the MLS here, all the MLS team here, they, sh they show no relationship between the wage and the performance on the pitch. Uh, and more interestingly, in the past 11 years, there are different, nine different teams to win the MLS Cup or like basically the, the championship of the MLS. Out of 11 years, they have nine teams comparing to the best, uh, to the European counterparts, uh, for Premier League, there are six winners in the past 11 years, and for the Bundesliga, there are only one, Bayern Munich. Anyway, there might be a way that we can play against the odds, and the best example for this would be would go to Brighton and Brentford. I would say they're kind of like uh, model for moneyball teams in in a modern day. Uh, they have both Brighton and Brentford. They have really innovative strategies on on their own. Like they they have different strategy. For example, Brighton they curate a uh, undervalued player from the undervalued market to strengthen the team. On the other hand, Brentford, they try to exploit the fine margin in the game. They try to exploit the, the set, set pits, which already contribute to like 10% of the all goal scores. And interestingly, like 25% uh, of shots that Brentford have in this season come from the set pits and they are leading the, the set piece table in, in that respect. And this is what Moneyball is. It's all about defining, uh, fighting against the old. Sometimes Moneyball have seen as a tool to win everything, but it is not. It's like how to, Moneyball is all about how you can play in an unfair game and survive in the game that you could not compete with the big names. Okay, and yes, yeah, so that is for the business part. And we can also use the data to understand the game more. Like for example, this is called passing network. Basically, the average position of the player in the match and connect by the relationship between each player, like how the which player they send the ball into in, in each match. And this passing network is from Manchester City. Like, I think everyone knows that Pep Guardiola come with really nice football, like pass and move, like kill by 1,000 pass, something like that. And it's reflect in the passing network here. You can see that when they, they, start, the, the, they start to attack the opponent, they start with, uh, Three at the backs, and all the all all the attacking start from the goalkeeper here, like building from. It's all about building from the backs. And one thing that interesting is like you see all the players here. They are congest in the middle of the pitch because it's what is the area where Pep Guardiola fight is really valuable to attack the opponent. And we, we can also use this passing network to explore some uh, teams that, are, that play really interestingly in the lower league. For example, this, this is the passing map from Ipswich Town. Right now, they are the second in championship uh, or the second tier in English ball. And the reason why Ipswich is very interesting because they just getting promoted last year from the third tier into the second tier. And they're playing, playing in the really structure where if you can see all the paths they play start from the back as well. And they play like through, sorry. They play through the, through, through the well-structured team and try to attack at the flank, something like this. But only putting the chart here might not really showing. So I would like to show how they play on the pitch. 
Uh, sorry, sorry. Look at this. Oh, oh, sorry. Look at this face here. Uh, look at the passage of play here. The if with is the team in blue, and you see how how they like congest the, this side of the pitch here, like try to invite coventicity in, into the areas to open the space over here, and they will play the ball long into the another flank. So in in football tactic, it's called like isolation. So they try to isolate the the other flank and attack at the other flank by overloading the the end of at at the end of the pitch. Look at this this guy here, pay bond into the other flank, and look at this guy, this this number thirty three here. They are they are player that run overlapping here to uh to in, to distract those two players to open the space, and this guy score like really nice goal. So this is just last week. This is what they play in the in, in the championship. Anyway, like the reason I show that clip is because sometimes when we look at the data, we just saw only one side. Like only data cannot capture everything on the pitch. So we need to use something called eye test to accommodate with the data so you can see the whole picture like the what the game actually is and that come to what I would like to invite everyone to build the narrative around the teams or or the player that you're interested in or maybe you can ask some interesting question about the about the game with with the data and the right narrative for example I will start with like intimating question, uh, something like I would say penalty kick is an unfair punishment. If you remember the reason why I say that, if you remember, <coughs> if oh oh, if you remember the expected goal here, you can see all the chance that could score, like uh, all the numbers here show the chance. In each area, like how, or what, what are the probability that that player should start from the from the several area, and if we cut down the chance of scoring from different position in the penalty box, it's all under, and it it's all under zero point five percent, like fifty percent chance, all the all the chance in the penalty penalty box on average has lower than 50% of the chance to become score. On the other hand, if you get a penalty, it go up to 80%, let's say. So that might not be a really fair way to give a reward to a team that on, on the penalty kick. And I have some example for you here. Like, this is a match from Man City and Arsenal. Look at this point here. Like, how, how much do you think Bernardo Silva will score from that position? Like he's facing the stand and there is no player in front of the goal. It could be like 5, 3% chance of scoring, but he got the penalty with that. So the chance becomes 79%. Or also this chance here. Look at the corner here. Uh, we have the ball and here, look, look at this guy here. He's, he was kicked while running back toward his goal, but he ended up getting penalty. Do you think this is fair for, for giving a penalty to the guy who are running toward his goal? I, I don't think so. Right? So, so next time when you see the penalty award in, in the game, you might, you might start asking this kind of question with, with the data in, as well. And we can also do something more interesting, like I believe all of the <laughs> Manchester United fans <laughs> will say Onana may be a bad idea. And someone who don't know, the, don't know Andre Onana, he is this guy here. This guy here is Andre Onana. Like he is a new keeper for, for Manchester United and he is really good at distributing the ball. And people say like he should better playing elsewhere rather than in a goal. 
but I don't think so. Onana is one of the best goalkeeping uh, goalkeeper in Europe right now. This is his performance compared to other players in Europe. He sit well at the 77 percentile against all the goalkeeper in top five league in Europe. You, would you say people at the 70, 77 percentile is a bad player? I don't. It's hard to say, right? And let's see how well he can do. Like, look at his uh, Onana over there. He tried to protect the near post and open a lot of space, and he still managed to deflect this shot. So I, I, I don't think this is a bad keeper performance. And, and if you ask, if he a good player, why Manchester United plays so badly? I would say because the problem is not, problem for Manchester United is not their keeper; it's somewhere else. Okay, so some sometime or another might might be a problem in in this team as well. But there are also other players that have far worse issue in Manchester United team this time because they are the eleventh players that allow opponents to score a goal in European leagues. And you see, if, if you see the name here, only Manchester United is, is the really common name in football. Other teams like Lurentau, Dermstadt, or Korn, they are not really big team, right? But, and right now, Manchester United among those small teams. Okay, so I'm running out of time. And like, okay, let me... Yes, okay, so... I think that is, uh, this would be my, my, my last slide for my presentation. Like, uh, one of the points that I want to, to, ch to speak in this conference, I would like to share, uh, to build a community for this football analytic stuff in Thai language because I, I see a lot of, I see plenty of uh, communities in, in English and in other languages, but not in Thai. Oh, I see. We, I, I only see these three pages on Facebook that provide this kind of uh, community and, and discussion in Thai. So I would encourage and really welcome everyone to join our community in football analytics. Okay, so I think that's all for me. All the data and visualization and script to produce the, uh, the visualization I will upload in GitHub and, and tag along with, with when the video is uploaded. Thank you.